Hi, everybody. Every summer, I take about 20 Northeastern students to the Netherlands for a course in sustainable urban transportation. And there, they see something that's very unusual to the American mind, to the American eye, which is people of all ages riding bikes as a normal, everyday way of travel. Whether they're going on errands, going shopping, going to the swimming pool, going to church, they go by bike as easily as you or I might go in a car or on the subway. How do children over there get to school? By bike. What's the most popular way of getting to the train station? Again, it's bike. Which is why uh, at outside of uh, train stations in the Netherlands, you'll see thousands of bicycles parked. 80% of the people there ride a bike at least once a week. And in the overall transportation mix, 26% of trips are made by bicycle. And as this graph shows, there are many other countries in Europe where a substantial number of trips are made by bike. And then you can compare the US, where we're down at 0.7%. Somebody has calculated what that difference means in terms of the number of calories burned while riding a bike for transportation. In the US, because we ride so little, it's two, two calories per person per day, while in the Netherlands, 35. That difference over a year amounts to three and a half pounds of fat. Three and a half pounds of fat that people there aren't putting on, and that we, well, maybe are, <laughs> without making any special effort like going to the gym, but just by changing the way they get places. I ask, uh, I ask the question, then why don't Americans ride bikes more? After all, Americans love to ride a bike. Uh, we buy more bikes every year than we buy cars. And bicycling is one of the most popular activities people do when they're on vacation. And on top of that, more than 50% of the trips that Americans make are three and a half miles or shorter. So then why wouldn't we want to incorporate something like that into our daily lives? Well, the answer is pretty simple. It's because to get someplace in America, chances are, to get someplace on a bike, chances are you're going to have to ride in traffic on a busy road. Maybe like think of riding on Huntington Avenue, the road that passes right through our campus, where since 2000 people, four, since 2000, four, pe four people have lost their lives riding a bicycle. Uh, now, you can ride on a road like this. Sure, you can claim your right, claim your space. And if cars honk at you, hey, that's a good thing. It means they see you. <laughs> you know, some people have the nerve to, some people have the nerve to, uh, to ride like this. But for most people, they'll say, uh, no thanks. I think I'll just leave my bike in the garage and wait for my next vacation. You know, uh, we also, some cities lately, have been making a lot of bike lanes. Definitely a step in the right direction, but still not providing nearly enough protection from the dangers of traffic. When you're riding next to parked cars, all it takes is one person opening a door without looking, and you can be slammed down on the pavement, or worse. On top of that, a lot of the bike lanes are discontinuous, and half the time they're blocked by double parked cars, so you have to go out into traffic anyway. Well, in the Netherlands, bike riding doesn't have any of that kind of traffic stress. Their cities are crisscrossed with bike paths where you can ride separate from traffic and most of the time in a pleasant green environment. When I go there, I see kids riding to school. It really cheers me up and I think, why couldn't we have more of this in our country? I see people riding into the city for work or for shopping without the expense and hassle of owning a car, without having to worry about a parking place. They're saving time, saving money, having fun, and I think, you know, this could really take off back home if only we would provide the same kind of low-stress paths that they have in the Netherlands. Well, coming back to Boston, it turns out that we do have some very nice bike paths here. Some lovely greenway paths in linear parks, 
like along the, Char along the Charles River, along the Muddy River. We have the Minuteman commute commuter bikeway in Lexington and Concord. We have a lot of nice paths. Here's a map of them in the Boston area, about 90 miles worth. You'll see some of the paths there that you recognize. But if you look carefully at this map, what really jumps out is that a lot of those paths are broken into pieces and all of them are disconnected. That's right, not one of these major paths touches one other one. And so what that means is if you want to ride to work on a greenway path, something that a lot of people would find appealing, you can't do it unless your home and your work happen to lie on the same unbroken segment of Greenway. And how likely is that to happen? We analyzed all the home-to-work pairs <laughs> in this 21 community region. And it turns out that allowing for one kilometer access at the home end, another kilometer access at the d destination, only 0.7% of home-to-work pairs could be connected on a Greenway. You know, we would never think of building a highway here, a highway there, and not connecting them into a network. Same thing with transit lines. That's why we can speak of a transit network. But because the greenways that we have are not bundled together in a network, they can't get you from here to there, and their utility for transportation is completely undermined. Well, I wanted to do something about that, and I thought the way I can contribute together with my students is by showing people feasible designs for all those broken and missing links. Engineering students have to do design projects anyway. So over the last 10 years, I, they have done about 15 projects in which they've designed greenway paths, especially for these missing links. And right now, I just want to show you about two of them, Charles Gate and Arbor Way. Charles Gate is where the Muddy River flows into the Charles River. But as you can see from this satellite view, the Muddy River Path doesn't flow into the Charles River Path. It's separated by an obstacle course consisting of railroad tracks, mass turnpike, Starro Drive, and a mess of ramps that connect Starro Drive to Fenway. And this is a maze that has puzzled designers for many years, but my students were able to figure out a feasible solution taking advantage of excess space on two highway bridges, and creating a, a new two and a half acre park overlooking the Charles to boot. And I'm glad to tell you that as of last December, Massachusetts DOT announced its intention to build the first stage of this connection in an upcoming project, which is that two and a half acre park. Then I want to tell you about Arbor Way. Arbor Way was originally part of Olmsted's Emerald Necklace with walking paths and the path for horseback riding, as well as a carriage road for vehicles. In the 1950s, it was transformed into basically an eight-lane highway. The paths were gobbled up, as was a lot of the parkland, all in the name of progress. Well, this was a difficult one, too. But again, my students found a feasible solution. Using high-efficiency intersection designs, they showed that it was possible to carry all the traffic that that road carries now in a much smaller roadway footprint that would allow us to expand the park and restore those severed paths. So Charles Gate and Arbor Way are two examples of what I consider the first strategy for connecting and expanding our Greenway network, which is paths along historic parkways. There are many more historic parkways that, like the two I showed you, can be reconfigured to include paths for walking and bicycling, as you can see there on the map in purple. A lot of those parkways, like Arbor Way, were expanded in the 1950s when what people wanted was you know, arterial roads. And that's what they asked the park department to do for them. Well, times have changed. And it's time to give our Metropolitan Parks Department a new mission, which is put the park back in our parkway. A second strategy for expanding and connecting the Greenway network is rail trails. We already have some rail trails. Did you know the Minuteman Commuter Bikeway is America's most used rail trail? But there are still many opportunities for building trails along railroads that have been abandoned, 
as well as railroads that continue to be in use. And none of them is more important than this link, a, a trail that will go along the same rail line where we are about to build the Green Line extension into Somerville. That trail will be an extension of Somerville's lovely community path. And it'll be so important because it's going to bring the Minuteman bikeway all the way to downtown Boston. It makes all the sense in the world to build that path as part of the Green Line Extension project because, after all, that path will be very helpful and useful in uh, enabling people to walk to all the new Green Line stations. But also because if we wait and install it later after the Green Line is running, that could easily double or triple the cost. Yet, at this time, while plans for the Green Line Extension project are advancing, there's still no commitment to include this path as part of that project. Okay, a third strategy is to build some whole new linear parks. Where would we find the space to do that, you wonder? And the answer is mainly on selected roads in the Boston area that, for various historical reasons, are much wider than they need to be in order to carry the traffic that they carry. An example is Rutherford Avenue in Charlestown. Rutherford Avenue is a 10-lane wide, bi-level monstrosity that was built in the 1960s to funnel all the traffic coming off of Interstate 93 into Boston because at that time, I-93 ended in Medford. I-93 doesn't end in Medford anymore. We've built it through Boston, and with the opening of the Zakin Bridge, it has a lot more capacity. And so Rutherford Ave isn't carrying the regional traffic that it was built to carry anymore and doesn't need to be that big highway. And so the city of Boston is planning to replace it with a beautiful uh, urban boulevard and then along the side a linear park, a mu much like the Southwest Corridor Park, that will have a greenway path running from one end of Charlestown to the other. And then uh, the last strategy is there will have to be some on-road connectors. But these on-road connectors have to offer people the same low-stress experience that they expect when they're riding on a greenway. And so that means either there'll be quiet residential streets that people will enjoy riding a bike on, or on busy roads, there'll be cycle tracks. That's a European-style bike path that's physically separated from the road and from the sidewalk, like this one in the Netherlands, or like this one in Montreal. And so here you have it, the network that we could have following these four strategies that I've outlined. Compared to the 90 miles of greenway that we have now, we're talking about 230 miles of greenway. And you can see the reach is terrific. It extends to every corner of the metropolitan area. And the coverage, 71% of people will live within one kilometer of a greenway. But what I like best about it is its connectivity. You remember how I told you that the exist with the existing set of greenways, less than 1% of home-to-work pairs are connected? With this proposed greenway, 51% of home-to-work pairs will be connected that you could ride from home to work on a greenway path. That, folks, is a game changer. This means for hundreds of thousands of people, a new option, a new and attractive option for getting to work, to school, shopping, wherever they're going, riding a, riding a bike on a safe, pleasant path, getting plenty of fresh air and exercise at the same time, saving money and saving the planet uh, while, they're, while they're just going about their daily work. OK, I hear you say, I like this. How much is it going to cost? Well, the answer is, it's going to cost a lot. <laughs> but at the same time, it's going to cost very little. What I mean is this. Good quality bikeways aren't cheap. Building out this network will cost several hundred million dollars. But if you spread that over a 10 or 12 year period, that amounts to only $20 per person per year. And in the overall mix of transportation spending, that is very little. 
Here's how we spend how, how we spend our money historically in the Boston metro area. Six hundred dollars per person per year on roads, four hundred on transit, and on walking and bicycling paths, about a dollar fifty. Changing that to twenty dollars requires only the slightest uh, correction in budget priorities to invest some money into a mode that addresses issues that we really care about. You know, you can go to a ski resort, and for $60, $80, they'll sell you a ticket that will allow you to enjoy all the wonderful trails on their mountain for a day. I want to sell you a ticket <laughs> for only $20 that will allow you to enjoy all the wonderful trails in the Boston area for a year. Sounds like a bargain. But this is a pretty radical idea, radical and new. And so recently, I've gotten together with some other advocates to form the Regional Green Roots Coalition to spread this vision to the public and to advocate for it with policymakers and, and elected officials. We want to see to it that every transportation project or development project that touches the Greenway Network should include the Greenway Path as part of that project, such as the Green Line Extension Project, including the Community Path Extension, as I described earlier. In downtown Boston, we want to see to it that the Rose Kennedy Greenway reverses its ban on bicycling and instead provides bike paths and invites people to use it so that it will become a real greenway instead of a greenway barrier. And we want to see that a reasonable amount of funding is provided for walking and bicycling at the state, metropolitan, and municipal levels so that this network can be built and we can start enjoying it in time for my grandchildren and not have to wait for my grandchildren's grandchildren. But ultimately, what these policymakers will do is listen to you, the public. And so that's why I hope that you've captured this vision with me of what a Greenway network can mean to our city. It means our children will have safe routes to ride a bike to school or to the playground. It means that you'll have a pleasant, low-stress route to ride to school, to, to work, to shopping, to wherever you're going. It means that our city will literally become a playground for people of all ages. Our city will attract tourists because of that, and companies will want to locate here because they're looking for the best amenities for their employees. Like the people of the Netherlands, you'll be uh, having some, getting some healthful exercise, you'll be saving money, you'll be saving time, you'll be saving the planet, and you'll be having a lot of fun. 